Hi, this is Dan Muncy. I'm with the IFC Tech Council. We're really excited today to have 100 feet. Uh, you're doing a great presentation for us. If you've ever wondered as a firefighter, as a, as a fire officer, chief officer, fire chief, how does the pizza guy, how does he know exactly where to deliver that pizza in that apartment complex when uh, some of us are struggling in our own jurisdictions on knowing exactly where that address point so we had the opportunity to meet with 100 feet and they were able to show us some of this technology and we invited them to present to you our tech council and to the greater ifc membership i want to introduce jeff doolin from the ifc jeff do you have any uh, things to say before we start off i just like to welcome uh everyone joining today and i think you're going to enjoy this presentation and at the end we'll have a little discussion about fri uh thank you very much for joining today chief Thank you very much, Jeff. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to 100 feet to start the presentation. Right. Um, thank you, Chief Mansi. Thank you, Jeff. Um, just a quick introduction. I'm Nathan. I'm one of the founders and the CEO of uh, 100 feet. Um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to present to you um, on, on what we do. Um, you know, the way we're going to structure the presentation today is we're going to talk about um, you know, who we are. Um, what's the value we bring to public safety and how we work with different public safety agencies. You know, if um, this is something of interest, you know, how, how you can um, begin to use this today. Um, you know, what's coming, what's on our plan and roadmap um, and, you know, feedback over their help. So towards the you know, end of the uh, presentation, we'll go into questions and, and potentially get feedback on, on how you perceive this field unfolding, right? We're learning as, as, as we grow the company. So um, just some quick background on 100 Feet. Um, 100 Feet was founded um, just under three years ago, um, where um, you know, we, we saw the problem of both food delivery drivers, paramedics, firefighters, um, having a hard time accessing or reaching um, um, what we call as high density areas. So primarily MUDs, right? Where you have multiple tenants living in a single dwelling could be a single building apartment complex, a high rise, a garden style property, and so on. Um, what you see on the right side over here is sort of the genesis, um, the, the 100 feet entrance, where it says the entrance to the unit is actually what was my condo in a city called Mountain View in California, um, where I ran into a medical emergency. My mom was visiting. Um, and when I called up, uh, 911, um, you know, they were able to fairly accurately geolocate me. But um, what ended up happening was when the paramedics got to the location, they ended up ending at the red point you see over here, which is pretty much every leading company that it takes you to. So whether it's, you know, using Google or Esri or any of the other 10 providers out there. Um, luckily, my mom did get saved, um, but with a minute to spare, which is about 15 minutes. But this is a classic example of what we see day in, day out, both with you know, food delivery and pizza delivery drivers, is how do you get to the unit, right? Even if you know the exact location through um, you know, a bunch of different mediums from the cell phone to people telling the addresses, converting an address to a place that's accessible um, is, is something we specialize in, right? So um, I'll talk through on how we eventually, you know, looking at that opportunity and seeing how the current um, personnel on the ground were basically reaching these places. Um, we started solving the problem. So we actually started working initially with Google and Esri to solve it, but they were too slow for our taste. And I had a personal interest at this point to solve the problem given my mom's situation um, to see if we can actually um, you know, solve this once and for all across, across the states. Um, so you know, going from what we previously saw as a single red pen, we eventually came to a point where we thought we can actually tell, um, you know, firefighters and paramedics on, you know, where to pull the truck over, where to enter the building from, where to find the Knox boxes, and then, you know, actually tell them how to get to the unit, um, thereby saving lives. Um, so what, what we do is we basically, you know, um, fill up what we call as a critical void in location data today, which is the last 100 feet accurately. In retrospect, 100 feet is too small. Um, we, we now do more like the last 500 feet, where we realize that no one really has good data when it comes to you know, the last 500 feet in high density areas. right? When it comes to apartment complexes, condos, mobile home parks, trailer parks, 
on office complexes, malls, dorms, colleges, right? No one really knows what they're doing on the ground. Um, and probably the most advanced today are, um, you know, the fire personnel who, who have some understanding, um, you know, gained by experience over the years on how to get to these places. But, but they still, it's not available as readily as they see every other kind of data that exists. Right, so what we did was we basically developed a bunch of different proprietary techniques to create very high accuracy data. And by very high accuracy, I literally mean like four nines, 99.99% accurate data um, for high density areas at a big scale. So we're not trying to solve this for, you know, a thousand apartment complexes, but can we do it for every single apartment complex, for example, within the US. Right, we, we take this data and then we surface it um, through a bunch of different products um, APIs, um, feature services in ASRE, geocoding services. And then that gets used by a variety of public and private partners. So um, when, when we started the company again, you know, our driving force was sort of twofold, which was um, logistics um, um, and, and deliveries, right? So, so goods logistics and people logistics. And people logistics could mean um, public safety, is a good example of a person trying to get to a location fairly quickly. Um, but then we go across sectors, right? We'll help the food delivery drivers, we'll help the grocery delivery driver, package delivery, whatever kind of delivery it, it, it entails, right? All of them sort of run into the same issue today, which is how do you actually get to the apartment, right? As we develop the company and the product and the data, we saw a lot of interest also from telecom companies and insurance companies who use this data for one 5G network planning. So we have the biggest um, telecom company in US today using this for their tower deployment to understand who can actually get a 5G network as it rolls out. And then we have insurance companies to actually start altering their premium for insurance based on accurate data, right? We have a lot of interest from real estate companies who are both clients and partners. So we ingest a lot of data from real estate companies, but then the real estate companies use this data for better client management and marketing, right? So half of the real estate tours, for example, today would get eliminated if people just knew whether their unit was facing a swimming pool or the street, right? And that information is just not available. So, so we span across sectors. Um, public safety, again, was, was the genesis and still remains closest part in what we're trying to solve, right? Um, but, but the others are where sort of we had early wins where you know companies were facing a big bottom line impact in terms of delivery times, customer satisfaction, and so on. Um, where, you know, we made the inroads to work with them early on. Um, our biggest paying clients today come from um, delivery companies um, like Uber Eats and Instacart and so on, and then telecom companies like Verizon. Um, our skill today for the data, this is sort of how we keep vetting the data on a continuous basis, unlike every other data company is, we literally process over a million deliveries every day, right? So, and these are all happening just to sort of the segment we talked about, which is the MUDs or MDUs, so multi-dwelling units, right? So um, what happens is that as these companies see our data, they also provide us feedback, telling us what happened in that delivery. How much time did it take? Did the driver miss the delivery? Did they have access issues? You know, was there a gate that wasn't working? So by effectively optimizing their operations, one is, you know, we're helping them save a lot of money and make the customer happy. But our data is usually at the forefront of freshness, right? So pretty much every complex in US today gets touched by one or the other of delivery partners, which means that the accuracy in data, the new construction, um, if it's something which even USPS may not have, we'll actually get the data for that much before anyone else does. And it's the same thing with telecom where, you know, accurate data is critical for 5G positioning. When Verizon started with us, for example, they used their data to determine if someone can get 5G network or not. Today, they actually use it for their entire tower positioning, right? And these are all multi-million dollar contracts um, of, of how important this data is and their day-to-day -day operations. The good part is as Verizon expands, they're targeting all the new construction coming up. So, Companies like Verizon will work with us to map out properties that, again, you know, are still very early on in the construction cycle, 
um, or sometimes you know they're halfway constructed. So three buildings are constructed, three are under construction, um, and no other data provider or no other um, location service has accurate data around these buildings because it's just not public yet. But people have started to move in. Accidents are on a high, usually it's a high construction area. Um, and that's you know where we can we, we step in and, and we have the data much before anyone else. In real estate, which is sort of a third big market today, um, our data gets used heavily for sales and marketing, right? We will know everything about the units, not just their location, but we will know their roof material. Um, we know what's hazardous and what's not. So if someone wants to install a solar panel, right, real estate companies will reach out to us and say, all right, which areas don't have a solar panel? Which apartment complex? Right, so, by, by providing them accurate data, for, uh, we, we do this for about 8 million apartment units today, or about 60,000 apartment complexes um, across the US. Um, you know, they, they use this data for their targeted marketing. Um, our data has been growing at about 500,000 to a million units month on month. Right? So, most of the data that got created was the beginning of this year or from middle of last year rather before COVID hit and everything shut down but our data ramp up has resumed and we're sort of creating data across us um, at the same pace we were before COVID. Um, map out every every unit we can in that city but begin with the bigger apartment complexes and then go to the smaller ones, right? The value is much higher in um, areas with 500 units, right? Or in areas where there's a bigger hazard like a hospital or a mall. And, and then we'll go into very small places with a building with 20 units. But, but we will try to map everything out as we go along. Sorry, my screen stopped sharing. Hopefully my screen's back up. Um, maybe this room, you know, screen stop sharing. Um, Can everyone see the presentation now? Yes, we can. Awesome. All right. And and why we sort of you know focus on multifamily addresses are because you know at least in our discussions with fire chiefs across the nation, they're one of the bigger challenges. Right. So number of new housing units with 20 plus units has grown about two and a half times in the last decade alone. Right. We're seeing high density increasing about 2% to 3% year on year in national um, housing numbers. So, um, you know, that steady ramp means most of your new construction is happening in these multi dwelling units. And from the statistics published in pretty much all fire journals, about 79% of all fires are from residential addresses. And despite a national average of about 20% of housing or 22% of housing being multi-dwelling units, 38% of the fires are from multi-family residences. So they're almost two x as likely to get a fire than say a single family residence. Right, and that number has been growing steadily, which is, um, you know, scary in, in the way the trend is growing in the number of, so, so on one side, you have the number of housing units growing um, fairly rapidly. Um, you know, the last dip that you see is, is basically COVID driven um, somewhat um, and that we hit a certain peak, but, but the fires started increasing equally rapidly as more and more population moves into these areas. And residential fires lead to a lot more fatalities versus non-residential, right? So if this was happening in a more open, spread out building, um, it's less likely to be fatal than a residential fire, right? So what we see is like per thousand fires, the fatalities and in, in, in MDUs is about 7.3. Again, this is way higher than you would want, right? Because for every thousand fires, if you're having seven people effectively dying that's not really a good position to be in and the current solutions um, are interesting and, and most of you will know this right given the audience um, the, the one thing which surprised us when we entered the area was you know our, our trust was or you know when this happened with my mom but that 
of all people, um, we wanted paramedics and firefighters to have all the data. So when we talked to them to see why they don't have the data, they basically did in terms of paper binders, right? So most fire trucks we've seen have this big paper binder in the truck, which you flip through um, to see a map of where you're heading, right? And, and to, then to do a pre-plan. Now the accuracy of these paper maps is really high, right? Most of these have been drawn by firefighters, right? We have, when you have interns coming in or new firefighters coming in, we've seen, you know, teams of them going out and, and mapping out properties, right? Which are then nicely laminated and put into these binders. Um, unfortunately, when we started accessing these binders, we saw tons of maps which were very old. They were not accurate anymore, but, but overall the accuracy was very high, except the utility was really low and the scalability was low. We saw most binders that we've seen cover only about 10 to 15% of the apartment complexes, right? So they're well trailing behind the development. Um, and that, that's something we started with, right? When we started the company, we started talking to the fire departments and started getting these paper binders and, and basically take them in a format where we could actually get them to scale, right? So use that data that you already have and create a lot more data to basically get to a very high scalability and accuracy number. And we've also seen PSAPs, um, you know, take notes um, and, and we looked at that again. I think PSAPs take a lot of notes for every call, especially the repeat call that helps a lot. Um, but a lot gets lost in translation um, and, and that's where the accuracy starts dropping. And then there's the existing mapping platforms, right? Everything from the most popular Google Maps to um, Apple Maps to Esri, where you basically have data for every single address, except when it comes to high density areas, the accuracy is really low. Each one of these mapping platforms is aggregating data from the same sources, right? Whether it's your GIS department, whether it's a national address database, um, whether there's you know data that was published a decade ago, they're all aggregating the same data. No one really is creating data at scale. And unfortunately, when it comes to MDUs, the data just doesn't exist to aggregate. So where we position ourselves today, and given our current coverage of about 40% of apartments in US, we aim for the same accuracy that you see with paper binders, with hand-drawn maps, right? Of course, in a much more usable manner because it's actually overlaid on top of a satellite image or a GPS image, right? Where you can see your location and the unit location. And we want the scalability to be high so that we don't get to only 15% of the apartments, but when we are mapping a certain region, we get to 90, 95% of the apartments, right? So effectively, the, the aim here is to get to the best of both worlds where you have very high accuracy at a big scale. Right? And, and we're well on the way to do that today. And I'm going to jump into a demo right after this, but what you see on the left over here is the world today. It's an apartment complex. This entire thing that you're seeing on the screen is just one apartment complex with one street address. And what you're seeing on the left of that arrow is how the world sees this apartment complex today, right? There's one pin, usually somewhere on the leasing office, not necessarily, but that's pretty much where every service takes you to. And what you see on the right is how we envision the world. Right. What we see is every unit independently, every elevator, every staircase, every entrance, every point of interest, right? Swimming pools are a classic place of emergencies, uh, sports centers, clubhouses, offices, right? So we take the world on the left and convert it to the world on the right. So, so I want to run through a, a few examples um, of you know, how this actually looks like. Um, and, and then we'll sort of continue the presentation more. So I'm going to pull up a, a few. So, so first I want to sort of show you just a brief review of what, what today's world looks like, right? So this is sort of a map that's usually available maybe outside an apartment complex, right? It's published as a billboard. It may be in the leasing office or it might be in your paper binder, right? And, and there's only 15 to 20% of these maps. So 80% of buildings will not have these maps readily available. Um, but um, the, the way we work with this um, and why we're different, I want to begin with the simplest use cases first. Um, some One of which we saw is sort of the example that I showed on the screen previously, which was the 2255 showers drive in Mountain View, right? Where Google actually did have accurate data and another service had accurate data. Um, this is also the data you'll get back from the phone GPS location and so on if that's enabled. 
right? The problem is most of the time when people are seeing this at the point and trying to get there, they'll end up navigating here. Um, and, and we see this in real life, but this entire thing is a ball. So, so the only entrance to the building is actually um, on the north end of the building. Right, so when we create data, we create this as a process, right? We tell you where the unit is, but more than that, we'll tell you there's a gate which requires a gate code or a knox box, and that's the best place to pull over the truck. So that's where you should navigate your truck to. Right, um, we'll also tell you the floor number. Um, you know, in in um, for for especially for fire agencies, we'll actually tell you the altitude if required, so the min and the max height of the of the floors. Um, we'll tell you if there's an elevator available. Um, just um, on the platform. Jumping to a different example. So this is the example we were showing of the apartment complex in Sunnyvale, where every other service um, takes you to the, the tennis court, right? Or maybe the leasing office. But in this case the, the unit um, you know M101 is actually in this building where that's where you should park if you were to get to that unit that's where the entrance to the building is right it's on the first floor so you don't care about the stairs or the elevator and that's where the unit is right simply clicking on navigate so whatever navigation software you're using whether it's embedded in Esri or Google or Apple right we'll simply change the navigation left lat long to make sure your truck gets to right in front of the building Right, so instead of taking you all the way to the leasing office and then making you know your personal walk around, we'll actually navigate them right in front of the building, right where where it's the best place to pull up and and enter the building from. Again, you know, firefighters don't have problems with parking anywhere, so we actually change the system based on the use case. Right, for delivery drivers, we'll show them a parking location, a formal one. Um, with fire personnel, you know, they can just pull up in front of the entrance and and get going from there. You also have the unit location if, in case you just want to pull a hose. And the one thing we promised, as I told you before, was 99.99% .99 accuracy, right? So this is a classic example of you know an address in Oklahoma where uh, something like Google and Mapbox and here, um, which are sort of the three most popular services, take you to a completely different apartment complex for that address. Right? And, and this was a real use case, actually. This was a gas leak that happened where the firefighters ended up here. Luckily, there were two trucks and one of the firefighters knew about our, you know, we have a free app out there, which some firefighters use, and they ended up coming to um, our location, right? And, and they prevented the leak. So all they knew was there's a leak around unit A at this address. But, but that's the kind of inaccuracy that scares us. And, you know, while you think that there are services, other services which are, you know, close to equally accurate, um, the problem is most other companies that we've encountered don't know when they're wrong. So this is another example of an address in Texas where the unit is a fair distance away from where everyone else is taking you, right? There's no map available once you enter the place. You actually have to walk around and go on a maze hunt. And, you know, Smarty Streets, for example. Was... All right, so um, jumping ahead. Yeah, so I think this is something you were discussing right now is, you know, we call this semantic waypoints. We, we don't treat everything as just one point, but we tell you every obstacle you're going to face on the way while you get there, right? So not only do we know the entrance to the building, we'll know if the society has a big gate to it. Uh, we know if it's a man society, we'll know if you have to walk through a bunch of gates and hook through them to, to actually get to the unit. So not just one gate necessarily. We know every entrance, every elevator in the building. Um, and, and just to give you, give you an example, right? All of this is sort of, you know, can be projected on not just a 2D view, but a 3D view, right? So, so not only do we understand the more accurate data, we actually understand a lot more detail, right? So in this case, for example, the unit 1229, right? We know how high it is. We know how close it's to the stairs. Uh, we know how close it's to the elevator, to the entrance and so on, right? So effectively, you know, your PSAPs and, and the, the people on the ground, both of them know what they're going to face once they get there. I'm going to sort of jump to a second example of, you know, how this data then get, gets augmented with people on the ground, because once you know this, you know, we overlay the data um, using an SD feature service with all the fire hydrants around the properties, right? And now I know the hose length. Something we, we learned is one of the hardest things is if you pull out the wrong hose, then it takes a lot longer 
to go back and pull up the right one to actually get to an emergency fire. Right. So, so when we create the data, we be able to do these calculations on the fly again, because we know the altitude and we know the accessibility of the unit, right? If this was facing inside the courtyard, your strategy is completely different from a unit that's facing outside the building. Right. And, and that kind of detail is, is something we, we work on today. And, you know, there are different ways of um, how this data can get used and there's different touch points within your agencies where the data gets used, right? So there's the PSAPs where, you know, PSAP portals effectively um, are in real time um, providing guidance to the caller, right? And understanding where they are. Um, then there's the CAT systems with the 911 dispatchers, right? Um, which get more details around the address, right? So typically PSAPs will punch in an address to the CAT systems. Sometimes a lat long might go um, but then the CAD systems will, um, you know, use more attributes they can find around that address um, to to direct um, personnel, you know, the firefighters on the ground, and and make sure that the correct apparatus can get deployed. Right. So they're the ones who can basically run the calculations to see what kind of a hose to pull out, um, which side of the street to park the truck on, where to access the unit from, and so on. And then of course, first responders on the site, um, you know, have everything from different kind of tablets to phones running a bun bunch of incident management apps to, to understand what's happening over there and what the entry and exit strategy is, for instance, right? And, and that's where we seek to reduce um, response time even further because they are at the highest risk when, when getting to these properties. And we work you know, across, a, across the entire spectrum um, today. So, we're not trying to replace what you have in place. Um, the, you know, when, when, as, as we've gone along this area, what we've done is we've taken a simple partnership approach, right? Where we're trying to work effectively with every provider out there, whether you're using you know, whatever PSAP portal you're using or whatever CAD system it is, or whatever incident management system it is, right? We're gonna work with all of them potentially and, and have a data surface over there. So you don't have to put in extra resources, extra training, to actually train um, your your firefighters or your personnel to to learn a new tool or remember to pull out a new tool, right? And today we're integrated with about half of these already, and the other half are in progress, right? We're live um, on Esri as a feature service. We're we done with Rapid SOS, I believe, by by the end of next month. We're already integrated into Tablet Command and Marvelous, which is beginning to see the data, and I can show you some screenshots which look really cool on what this looks like, right? We're in deep discussion with the Intera. Um, and, and same thing with rapid deploy. Motorola is actually jumping uh, the ship right now and is beginning to integrate, right? So whatever system you're using, the, the way we're doing this is we really don't want your teams to start learning a new tool and trying to remember to pull up a new tool. I, I we just don't think that's going to work. And that's the right approach uh, given the stress already the teams are in, right? So um, we, we're basically going with all of these partnerships where with basically a single trigger of a button, like we can surface the data without any additional work at your end. And then there are sort of, you know, a lot of new things that, that can be done once you have this data, right? So for example, with A3, we're working on an AR application where as you're looking at a certain building, we can start providing you every insight you need to get there in a 3D consumable view when you're on the ground, right? So in this example, not only are we showing you the location of every unit or a particular unit you're looking for, we're actually in a, in a, in a 3D view, in a, in a AR view, being, being able to tell you where to access and what direction to head in, right? And, and we think this is sort of eventually the future where people basically are going to wear these fancy glasses. Um, you know, we've seen this happen with Oculus and Facebook where all the AR and VR devices are coming in, but without the right data, there's not much utility to them. And, and that's sort of the gap you're trying to fill. So we're super excited about, you know, kicking off the entire AR application with, with S3. And lastly, I think the, the you know, we, we've sort of seen the 2D view of these things. We've seen that the data is 3D, but we're actually getting into a point where the entire navigation can be 3D. So in this particular example, you know, going from the entrance to taking the stairs to actually planning out your entire exit strategy is in real time, 
right? So we, for example, knew that there are stairs over here. Um, you know, you go, you go straight, you make a right, you take the stairs, go up X feet, then you have to walk through a bunch of corridors. And this is not an apartment, this is a church, right? So, so the problem is, is applicable across any kind of high density area, right? And, and that's how we see it. Um, so again, you know, we, we've started working with a lot of these um, colleges, um, schools, and churches to start mapping them out. Right, so we're becoming the authoritative source for their maps, and and the agreement with them is that we will surface these maps to all the fire departments that we build them, right? Um, and and we're the first responders because again, you know, with things like everything from fire hazards to active shooters, like this is a problem today which everyone is struggling with. Is how how do you get to these places, right? And and paper maps is just not getting us there fast enough. Um, lastly, I think, you know, as, as, as next steps, and we'll have a discussion right after this, is that um, please feel free to reach out, like if this is something of interest. Um, um, you know, I'm available anytime for, for, for a quick chat, coffee, call, uh, whatever you prefer. But um, more importantly, I think, you know, one, one thing that I do want to see if you can get out of this is um, digitizing your assets, right? The, the paper binders you have today, um, are very critical to us, right? We, we, we take those paper maps and we actually make them usable on the ground. So, so you know, most likely Vibhu and Tam will, will follow up with you. So please, please don't be surprised to ask for these pre-planned binders. You know, across the country, we make tons of FOIA requests to get every kind of data we can to make sure that, you know, when we are creating data, our accuracy remains intact. So the more data we have, the higher the accuracy is. And again, you know, we're not trying to use the data to um, um, to aggregate information, right? We want to be authoritative, so we'll try to look at the data from every perspective, make sure you know whatever maps we have line up with the paper binders you have. If there's an information missing, for example, Knoxbox locations, um, sometimes it's the fire panels, electrical panels, water shutoffs, and so on. Right? We're able to also surface those for you. And, and that's where you know, we, we love working with fire departments and, and helping sort of digitize those pre-planned binders in the right way to, to make them usable on the ground. And then we're looking for early partners, right? We're, we're live in a couple of counties today, um, but, but we do plan to make a service available pro bono for the first three to five IFC members, right? Especially if you're in a region where our data is strong, um, you know, we'd love to just start surfacing our data to you um, and get some case studies out of it, right? Again, as a company which is under three years old, it's very important for us to sort of build out the case study, right? We have real life examples of where we've saved lives. We, we get the thank you emails and, and that's really good to know. Um, we also get emails from a lot of um, firefighters and we've seen Facebook forums with firefighters discussing our app. Um, you know, we've never actually pushed our free app um, just because we think it's, it's not the right tool for fire personnel to use. Um, you know, it's an additional app that they have to pull out on their personal devices. But it is probably, there's a fair chance that if, especially if you're in a high density area, or if your county has enough apartments, which I think most counties do in the US today, um, some of your firefighters are already using their app. Um, and, and we'd love to get that feedback and, and formalize that relationship, right? And again, you know, with public safety, especially early on, we don't plan to monetize at all, right? It's, it's our way of giving back so whether it's you know following up for your pre-planned binders and digitizing them and making the data available to you, um, or or making your data generally available to you over your CAD, PSAP, um, dispatch systems, right? All, all of this is pro bono. All of this is free, um, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, and and we'd love to see how that impacts people's lives. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you for this uh, very informal presentation. We do have some questions that were asked in chat. And I think I've got a couple more that were texted to me. Uh, so the let's look at the uh, first questions here. Are, are there any fire departments providing data to help this project? And if so, who would that be? And if so, what type of data? So I, I think that there's sort of two ways in which I think you know we, we work with fire departments um, to, to get the data. So, so most of the time we'll create the data ourselves, um, ground up. 
but um, you know, paper binders that as I talked about is, is probably the first biggest source for us where we, we take that data and we make sure that the quality is still intact if there's new construction that's covered. Um, and, and then there are lots of firefighters who use our tools to actually create maps. So while you know you have your interns and, and new guys going out to create pre-plans and maps, um, we have a free tool out there to do that, which will automatically produce you know maps in both a paper form and a digitized form so that you don't have to put in double effort. Um, and I think that's the right model in which we work with the, with the fire departments today. Thank you. A question from John Dennison from Texas who asked, how does 100 feet create this data? Um, good, good question. Um, our data create, you know, comes from a variety of different sources. So we literally have people walking into every leasing office and every apartment complex and getting their hands on the same paper maps you were seeing previously, right? Um, now, we most of the time don't make people draw maps. We're actually fairly against drawing maps unless it's an expert drawing maps, right? Which is why we work with firefighters when we have to draw maps, which is about 20% of the times. Most of the time, we'll work with the leasing office, um, with the management office, with the HOA, um, to procure whatever maps they had. Then we'll go to the city offices and we'll try to get all the building blueprints, right? Then we'll make a bunch of FOIA requests to get, for example, elevator permit records um, to find out which buildings have elevators and which have gates which are locked and so on. Like there's a lot of information like lying out there in a non-consumable consumable manner today. So we'll make all of these requests, we'll collect all of this raw data, which is really bad in its shape and form as is, right? These paper maps that we get from leasing offices are not even legible half the time. But then we'll take all of that and we'll start processing these maps at scale. Um, a couple of um, you know things we do, and, and one example I, I should have jumped into is that we'll discover hidden information in, in these properties. So an example is in, you know, um, actually I'm gonna pick a different example this time from Georgia. Um, so there's this apartment complex in Georgia, which has Yeah, in, in Decatur, in Georgia, where every unit has a different street address, right? So there is no unit number. But when we're looking at real call records, both to 911 and um, to delivery services, a lot of people give the address as 10 Highland Lake Drive, apartment 1315. Now, that's an illegal address as per USPS. If you go to USPS, they're gonna say they can't deliver over there. But that's how people speak, right? So you can't really change people's behavior overnight or necessarily it's never gonna happen in the next decade, right? Um, and understanding those kind of intricacies is something we specialize at. So whether someone called and said, hey, I'm at 10 Highland Lake Circle, apartment 1315, when everyone else is baffled because, you know, again, 10 Highland Lake Circle is really an office, a leasing office, right? Or whether they say 1315 Highland Lake Circle with, without a unit number, which is a legal address, right? We understand they're talking about the same thing. So, so we create the data ground up, we'll go in and we'll try to discover every possible pattern for this data, um, which you cannot do if you were just aggregating data, right? So we'll work with the fire departments. One, you know, as we said, we'll get your pre-planned binders and, and digitize them, but then we'll work with the leasing officers. We'll have our own ops team go in and talk to the leasing managers and HOAs and get those maps. We work with builders who are doing new constructions to get maps even before they build properties. Um, we actually work with some fire departments where firefighters help us draw maps. Um, and then we have our own specialized team of people who will go in and draw maps. Then today, about 10,000 gig economy drivers are helping us, right? People who are driving for DoorDash and Uber Eats are actually collecting maps for us. Um, and, and then again, you know, once the raw maps are collected and the FOIA request data comes in, all of this goes through a massive machine learning pipeline to, to surface it in the shape and form you see. So how are you on this scale, how are you ensuring the accuracy? So it's incredibly important that the first responders arrive at the right location in the most expedient manner. And that is your business model, but how are you ensuring complete accuracy with, with just the mass amount of data address points that you're working with? Um, so good question. So I think that there's a twofold approach. One is, you know, what we call as a control set and a test set for the same apartment complex. So usually we don't publish data unless we have a secondary verification 
of the data. Right? So a lot of times, for example, when we digitize the map for an apartment complex, we'll reach out to the management office to give us a sign off, saying this looks accurate. Right? That's the secondary point. For the pre-planned binders that you have in your trucks, right? more than creating data from that, we'll use that to second verify the data we've created. Right? So we always have at least two points of vetting whatever data we are creating. That, that's the initial way of pushing the data. But then because we are, you know, we have commercial contracts with the biggest delivery companies out there, FedEx, Uber Eats, Instacart, right? Um, these drivers are going there day in and day out and we incentivize them to tell us when something is wrong. So we have a feedback loop as a part of our agreement with Uber and Instacart, for example, we, they are required to provide us feedback from the driver when they use their data. And that active feedback loop happening for millions of deliveries means that we're able to track those errors very quickly if there are errors, which is very rare usually, um, and again, the, the rate is like one in 10,000 maybe, um, we will pull out the map. Like we, we will not surface that data, right? Um, we try not to interpolate, extrapolate. We're not playing a guessing game basically. So we'd rather pull out the data and then some, have someone else go there and redraw the map per se. Um, but you know that, that that's the operating model today. So so we'll have the feedback loop, active feedback loop, which almost no other data company in US has. Most data companies create data, give it, and they don't know what what happens right after that. But but we keep an active feedback loop. And second is that at least a multi-point verification across different sources. That's, that's an outstanding concept. We we tend to think of operability between public safety entities. Uh, we may visit that particular address point in an apartment complex maybe once a year. Uh, maybe three times a day, depends. But to partner with our business communities that are relying on, on this address point for every FedEx delivery, every pizza, uh, every time the Uber driver needs to pick somebody up and then to assure that accuracy, I think that that's allowing the automation of the system to uh, continually update itself. And I think that's a process the fire service is moving rapidly towards. And I, I like that you are leading the way in this area and really providing us that last 100 feet for us to make sure that we're connecting with our customers as soon as we can. So is there, I had another text question sent to me, are there tools that firefighters can use to create or augment these data databases? And I think you've answered a little bit, but if there's, um, as we're out there walking our buildings and talking to our, our customers, is there a way that we can go into the system and make those up? Correct. So yes, there, there are two, right? So at least um, in a current app out there, you can actually type an address and, and move things around. Again, you know, we, we'll look for a secondary verification of, of when data gets corrected. With, with firefighters, it's easier, you know, we can flag it and we can whitelist it. Um, but that's when you're, you know, moving individual points around. And that happens quite a bit, right? Both for, even for like very rural areas, right? Where you have half a mile by half a mile farm and you don't know the access point, right? Where's the entrance on what side of this big block do you enter the thing from? So you can make those edits on the fly and they're available to you right away to consume. And then other people will typically start seeing that data in a day or so, right? Once it goes through a verification process. The other is for high density areas, we have our own specialized map drawing tool, right? The aim over there was, can we be as fast um, in drawing the map digitally as you would be on paper? Right? which is something everyone struggles with. That's on paper, you know, you write in 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03. Um, so in this one example map I showed you, right? This is actually unit 101, 102, 103, or rather, sorry, 102, 202, 302, right? So it's three floors, it's not written, but, but drawing this map is fairly quick. If you were to draw this on paper, if you were to draw this with every unit, every building name, everything, it's really slow. So we, we have tools where, you know, it takes about, I would say between one and three hours of training where you can basically draw something with higher accuracy than this um, um, and effectively at a higher speed than paper. Um, so yeah, we provide those tools for free, you know, that data gets surfaced typically within 72 hours after you create it in, in whatever CAD or dispatch system you're using. Thank you. Speaking of, of dispatching and CAD, Mike Cox, the fire EMS industry manager for Esri asked, uh, can you describe how, or if you integrate directly into CAD software? Um, Vibhu, do you want to take that on? I, I have some thoughts. Yep. yep. So yeah, I, I can speak to that. So 
on the, in a nutshell, yes, we do integrate with everybody starting from PSAPs to CAT system to incident management, specifically for CAT systems like our, it's a simple API integration where once they send us a address and a subunit information, we send back our payload that contains all the micro location data. So XY, XY coordinates for that location for that unit, along with all the various points of interest in a predefined vicinity of that area or some of the addresses where we do have Z axis and increasingly we will have Z axis for more, most of these uh, properties, we will share the Z axis in terms of meters and floor numbers both. And that kind of, that sits in within the CAT system and then gets passed through the, uh, to, through the chain down to people on the ground as well. So the dispatchers have almost as high of a situational awareness as uh, somebody who's actually on the ground. Right. So, so today, like the data, we, we are already sort of, you know, getting integrated with Motorola and, and there's an ongoing discussion with rapid deploy, but usually these integrations don't take too long. Um, and, um, you know, it can be done within either your, you know, the, the service you're using their ecosystem or directly with on, on, the, on, on your CAD system, um, where a team will work with you to make sure you, you see that data. Thank you. Assistant Fire Chief from San Marcos Fire Department, Carl Kuhlman asked, do you have an example in a mid or high rise structure? And, and I'll ask you, if you do, would it be possible to pull it up and um, let us take a look at that? Yeah, good good question. Um, let's pull up some Chicago addresses. Vibhu, do you have any address on top of your mind? Uh, give me one second. Well, while you're working on that, let me ask another question as you're preparing that. So Kirk McKenzie, uh, one of the most forward thinking uh, individuals in the industry is asking or stating, very glad to see the various integration options. Uh, we also see Intergraft and My Three Words. I know that we've talked briefly about My Three Words between us. Since you're working in 3D format, if offered the building information modeling BIM, how might you ingest and display in M MXR? And are you working with any heads up display companies yet? Yeah. Is that I, I can explain it. Go ahead. Yeah, I can I can take that on while Nathan uh, pulls up the example. So we, we've, uh, I'll, I'll go backwards. So currently we aren't engaged with any heads of HUD companies yet. Uh, it is on a roadmap. It becomes extremely powerful when you have uh, XYZ access with, uh, with the existing data set that we have, which we are increasingly building out uh, in terms of the Z axis, X and Y axis are already there. So it's definitely on our roadmap. Uh, as you saw the example, when it comes to mixed reality, uh, what you saw in the video where we were working off of Esri's Augeo platform, which requires your phone, we foresee something like that being center stage. It's still a little early in terms of what's the clear partner in the mixed reality or augmented reality world out there, uh, given our goal is to get to market with partners and not just build something standalone ourselves. That's why it's a, like we're we're looking to identify who that clear partner is. It could be Motorola, it could be uh, Integraph, or it could be any of the third-party applications who are in the HUD space. So we are actively looking for those, and the goal is to have this available, all our data available and functioning there. In terms of how it's ingested, it's again, like fairly straightforward. Like everything that we see here is a very simple GeoJSON, which can, can kind of work with any system. So it's platform agnostic, uh, it's base map agnostic, and everything else is fairly easily available. Uh, when it comes to what three words or my three words, I think that's a slightly different use case compared to what we are trying to address. So the real value for what three words is in areas where you don't have standard addresses. Uh, if you're getting a PSAP call from a middle of a park, knowing those three words will be important because you may not know the exact street address for the park or the beach. But when it comes to uh, residential areas or urban areas, almost every call will come from an address. And that's what most people will convey to the PSAP or that's what you will need to direct your fleet to. Okay. And you want to add... Under one second. So on the word three words, right? The the fear we have, and, and we love them as a company, you know, we talk to them all the time and, and now we've known each other for a while, right? 
this is sort of my classic example of, you know, more accurate data can sometimes be very harmful. So in this case, for example, this is an apartment complex in Southern California where that's where the unit is and, and you'll get a really good accurate location for this. The problem is every navigation system out there today, right? Whether again, it's um, S3 here maps, Google maps, does not have the internal routes mapped. So they actually take you across the aquifer. Right. So, so when we created this, for example, we're showing the parking over here versus over here you know, from a navigation point of view, because if you were using any standard navigation software, you'll actually end up at a very wrong place. Right. So what, what we try to do is, you know, again, we're, when, when we talk about accuracy for us, the accuracy is not just the point accuracy. It's whether it's solving the problem or not. Right. And, and this is a classic example of when the problem actually higher accurate results, even if you're using my three words over three words, right? Getting this lat long, it actually gets you to exactly the wrong place, um, not the right place when you navigate, right? And over time, this data will improve, but then you're gonna run into the 2255 showers problem where you're on the wrong end of the building, right? So I think they're complementary to what they do. Eventually, you know, if you know the lat long, will tell you the right access points for it. And I think that's gonna be the long-term interaction. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I think that that kind of covers it. I was going to talk about semantic waypoints, which is what we just talked about. So this is perfect. And, and you know, for high rises, the data is similar. Um, we're very careful in how we create data. So for example, this unit, if you see, it's not lining up in the middle of what you're seeing because the satellite image had a skew, right? So when we create data, it's, it's sort of ground to truth correct, right? Versus getting a random skew on, on, on the data. So if you get out of the satellite view and you look at the building shape, this is where the unit is. But um, we work equally well. Again, you know, detected the floor for 10,002 um, and told you like the entrance over here looks weird, um, which is interesting because this is a building where that's the base. This entire thing is the base of the building and that's the high rise part of it. But the real entrance to the building is here, right? You can't like jump over the hoop and then come here. This is actually the second floor. Um, where you're seeing the terrace, and then that's where you should pull over. So, you know, the data is is equally stable for high rises. Um, I mean, this is just giving an example of the kind of maps we get for Chicago. And I mean, we're looking at thousands and thousands of units and tons of unprocessed data still, right? We, we're creating data, are we getting maps faster than we can process them? Um, but, but that's the kind of data that flows then, and eventually that's how it gets surfaced. So it, it's very similar to what what you see for garden style. The accuracy remains the same. We'll take care of building displacements, right? Sometimes what you'll see in maps is if it's a very high rise building, it's going across the street. No, we, we'll do it based on the base layer, not on top of the skew. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna I'll go ahead and share my screen and finish out this presentation. Is there anything that you guys wanna add before I do so? I think we could. Yeah, Thank you so much. We'll, do, we'll make sure that we get the recording to you, Chief, um, you and Jeff, and anybody that has any more questions after our our webinar, feel free to contact us. Or if you want a more um, intense, like one on one with your department and your department staff, and and review more information, let us know. And hopefully we'll see you soon uh, in North Carolina. We're looking, we're looking forward to making that acquaintance. So the IC Technology Council, this has been an example of our monthly webinar series. I want to thank our members that are here uh, and for your participation. And you're, you're truly what makes us successful. We're certainly looking forward to seeing everybody at FRI. That's going to be a great time. So I can get this to advance to the next slide. Now I'm having the technology problems. There we go. So uh, the IFC Tech Council represents all hazard, all risk, and responsible leaders. The IFC represents the leadership of fire and emergency responders worldwide. And our members are the world's leading experts in firefighting, EMS, terrorism response, hazmat, natural disaster, search and rescue, wildland fire mitigation response, and public safety policy. We serve as a knowledge center for the technology developments that affect the fire service. The council provides a forum for information and knowledge exchange amongst many different stakeholders, including fire chiefs, public safety organizations, and our vendors. 
Our vision is to advance the fire rescue EMS services and the allied agencies to be on the leading edge of the technological adaptation. 100 feet, you certainly showed us that you are there today. You're doing some great things. I love how you're working with various industries to aggregate this data and then sharing it with public safety to ensure that we can get to our customers as quick as we can so we can save lives. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you here. And I want to thank you and our membership and our technology leaders that were able to join us for, um, for participating in this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.